Welcome to Friday. We're starting off with lunch. It's lunch, right? It's lunch time. So this is lunch. Lunch at Cracker Barrel. Salad, pancakes. I copied Lindsay exactly. You got the blueberry pancakes, and you got grits. Do you like it? You don't know if you like it. I don't know. That's like the strangest type of food. I eat it, and it's like I'm eating it. Anyway, um, after this, we're gonna go to Boone Hall. We're gonna go to Boone Hall Plantation and um, explore the South. You'll enter Boone Hall on the world famous Avenue of Oaks, which is one of the most spectacular entrances anywhere in the world and the gateway to over 330 years of history. That tree's over 600 years old. Now, even though it's over 600 years old, it might have another couple hundred years. They can live that long sometimes. That's been confirmed by an arborist to be the oldest one out here. It's a live oak tree. And when we come up the Avenue of the Oaks, I'll tell you more about that type of tree because it's one that nature built to last. And again, that water is salt water. The water to the right is fresh water. The reason I make that distinction is because fresh water is where the alligators hang out. Now, it, I haven't seen one all day, which is unusual. So they may have taken off, you know, for, for the hurricane. I don't know. They, they, maybe they'll be back. They drained this pond after the hurricane because the salt water went into the fresh water and it would mess up the ecosystem. So it, 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 a couple of rains, it'll be back to full strength, or full um, depth or whatever you want to call it. But there are alligators out there. Alligators, lots of turtles, lots of frogs. And in this area, 30 different types of snakes. Six of them are venomous. I treat them all the same. I stay away from all of them. These trees are over on the left-hand side of this field. Anybody know what they are? Right here? Oh. Close. She said pecan. Pecan. Now, I, pecan, pecan. But I'll tell you, one day I was doing this tour and I said pecan. And the guy on the tram said, son, I'm a pecan farmer from Georgia. They're pecans, not pecans. I said, okay, why don't we just call them nuts? <laughs> At one time, there were 15,000 on this property. Largest producer in North America. Most of them lost to development, some to storms as well. We lost a bunch of them a couple weeks ago. Now there are fewer than 400. Going down this road, hard to imagine, but this at one time was the land of cotton. As far as you can see to the left and as far as you can see to the right, it was all cotton. But it hasn't been grown out here since the Civil War, so everything you see has had plenty of time to regrow. Now I'm sure you have figured out by now we have a little Halloween festival. Uh, this take the kids for hay rides. And the guys that work out here put the decorations up, did a great job because they had to do it twice this year, basically, because the hurricane pretty much destroyed everything. October has not been good to us. This October we had a hurricane. Last October we had a flood. Now this building to our left, that is an old movie set. It's from the movie Queen. Queen was in the Root series, it starred Halle Berry. Now, that's old Henderson's store. Now the building's not, not as old as it looks. It only dates back to the 1980s. But they left it here when they were completed filming it. And we talk about it some during the tours, but mainly October. Now you see, Experimental Laboratory. Last year it was a witch's important, different every year. Now, believe it or not, this is our first year with that dinosaur. And we had a contest to name that dinosaur. And Fluffy was the best we can do. <laughs> I'd hate to hear the other ones. Now this field to our left is a corn maze. The corn didn't do as good this year. Typically it's a lot higher than that. But it, every year it's popular, even this year. Especially with parents. See, they'll drop their kids here in the morning. Then they go downtown do the touristy stuff lunch, a couple of drinks, come back in the evening, still wandering around out there. Now the plantation is 738 acres. And of those 738 acres, they still farm about 120. So this is still a working plantation. It has been a working plantation since 1681. That's when John Boone settled here longest continuous working plantation in North America. Now this year, our crop was good, but not as plentiful. Reason is something I might have mentioned earlier. We had a real mild fall and winter. And peaches in the off season, they have to have some cold weather. 
they have to have so many nights of 40 degrees or less. And we just didn't have enough of them. So we, the peaches we have were good, but not as many. And anybody know what state produces the most peaches? California is number one in about 50 different crops. What if I asked you what state grows the tastiest peaches? Then you would say, it's a smart crowd. <laughs> Last guy said, George is walking back from here. All right, we're coming up on the Avenue of the Oaks now, or Oak Avenue, one of my two favorite places out here. These are live oak trees that were planted in 1743 by Thomas Boone. Now you have to appreciate his vision, or his imagination to create this scene knowing he wasn't going to get to see it. See, these trees take a century to get to the size that they are. And to form the canopy over the road, that takes two centuries. He only lived eight years after he planted them. So he knew he wasn't going to see them. Slave cabins over on our left. There are nine of the original 27 that were out in front of the house. They date back to 1790. They date back to 1790, but as recently as the 1940s, some sharecroppers lived in them. Hope you had fun, that's the main thing. If you did, just please remember your driver's Kevin. If you didn't, then you can blame it on Michael, that's the other guy driving. Kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya. Oh, lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, go up or come by here. Welcome to Boone Hall Plantation. One of the many plantations along what we call the Gullah Geechee Corridor that gave birth to the Gullah Geechee people and the Gullah Geechee dialect. West Africa, West Africa, Senegambia, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Angola, Liberia, Nigeria, Ghana. They brought us from West Africa to these parts strictly to work the rice plantation. Now, when they brought us to this side of the ocean, we got dropped off. That's right dropped off all along what we now call the corridor the Gullah Geechee corridor starting way down there in Jacksonville Florida coming up to Brunswick and Darien Georgia where we got dropped off at Sapelo Island St. Simon Island Jekyll Island when that ship got to Savannah they brought us through a port of entry we call the Ogeechee River when they landed in Buford we got dropped off at Port Royal and when that ship got shut at this Charleston port we got dropped off on this side of the river at a place called Sullivan Island, just a few miles from here. Now, that's where we had to stay to be quarantined, cleaned up, before they put us on the auction block. Now, after emancipation, we're free. Most of the Gullah Geechis that didn't go up north towards New York and Canada, the rest of them ended up settling on all the different sea islands here in Charleston. If you travel up 17 north, about 50 miles, you get to an area we call Georgetown, South Carolina. Now Georgetown too, back in the day, they were well, well known for their many rice plantations, more so than Charleston. Michelle Obama's great, great grandpappy, her mother's great grandfather, was born, lived, and worked at rice plantation in Georgetown. You travel outside of Georgetown, you get to an area we call Pauly's Island. And between Pauly's Island and Myrtle Beach, there's another little island we call Sandy Island. A little small island full of Gullah Geechis, but they don't want no bridge built on their island. And all these years, the only way they've been getting around has been by their own means, boat or raft. If you travel outside of Myrtle Beach, you got Little River, South Carolina, Little River, North Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina. And we call that entire stretch from Jacksonville, Florida, to Wilmington, North Carolina, and some parts of Virginia, the Gullah Geechee Corridor, the port of entry, for the West Africans, brought to these parts of the Americas in slavery. Now, I know you've read and heard, or possibly not read and not heard, the stories about what happened to us when we first got to this side. How we got beaten, how we got flogged, how we got our limbs cut off when we tried for runway. Oh yeah, all them things happened, even some worse. But we as a people, there was nothing they could do back in the day but keep the stories in their hearts for sing their songs, for do their dance, for laugh, for make merry, whenever they got a chance. That's how they survived. Now keep in mind, you had a few of them fellas that got treated okay by the master because they worked for him in some special capacity. But for the average slave on the many different plantations, oh, they did endure harsh and severe mistreatment. 
But eventually that too had to let up so that they could get the work done that they were brought to this side to do. The oldest building on Boone Hall is located on the front yard of what they call the big house. They called the master's house the big house. Now when we first get to the plantation, we used to eat the scrap off a of master's table. How so? What my story. That was my great-great-grandmother's story. Her name was Charity Martino. My great-great-grandmother came out of a slave family. Now at emancipation, they were free, sure not free, but sure enough, did not have anywhere to go. So they had elected, like so many of the other slave families, to stay on the plantation and work the farm for their room and board. But she told the family how at one time they would ring a bell. And at the ringing of this first bell, we would have to go to the trough in groups, and we would gather our food from the trough, hand them out, hand them out, hand them out, hand them out, stuff the food down their faces really fast. Why? Well, number one, they were hungry. Number two, you never knew when you were going to get another chance to get back to that trough again. So you were trying to get as much food in as possible. And number three, once they rang that bell for the second time, oh, that meant your group's time was up. You had to hurry and move out of the way so that the next group of slaves could come forward and eat. Well, as the years progressed, when Granny would see her children throwing food down their faces really fast, she would get on them with, look, you children, why are you trying to choke your food down so fast? Slow down, you eat. Ain't nobody ringing no bell now. At one time in this area, there were actually 27 brick slave cabins, three rows of nine cabins each. The other 18 have been taken down throughout the years because of the many storms and deterioration. But in these 27 brick slave cabins, only selected slaves were chosen to live. Oh yeah, you had to have had a special skill, had to have been working for the master in some special capacity. Boat makers, carpenters, the iron fellows, the blacksmiths, they made the gates and things, butlers, maids, cooks, carriage drivers, seamstress, tailors, gardeners, all them fellows and their specialties, they were the ones allowed to live in the brick. But now if you and your family were just regular field slaves, meaning you worked the cotton, the indigo, the maidas, the corn, the cabbage, the rice, then you and your family would be living in what we call a board house. Your board house was made of board, half the size of this brick cabin, dirt floor, no window, no fireplace, and your board house would have been located way up the field, a good distance away from the master's house. Now that's just how it was in the early years. Coming off of those many slave ships, we brought with us many of our own skills, trades, giftings, and crafts, and the oldest West African craft, still going stronger today in our culture, is the gift of basket making. We call them the sweet grass baskets. Now these baskets come in all shapes and all sizes and all prices. Now the original weavers in our family were not our women, they were our men. Our men made the big work baskets that were sometimes about half the size of these barrels to my right and left. Now when our men were weaving, they were actually using split oak and white oak bark. And our women found that just to be too harsh on their fingers. So our women were already putting sweet grass in their straw brooms. Now we pulled the sweet grass from the swamps and our beach fronts. And we call it sweet grass because while this grows, it actually has a very, very sweet odor to it. But once this is pulled and dried out, it begins to smell like regular old hay. Now added to the sweet grass is a material we call bulrush. You heard about the bulrush in the Bible. This is the same material that went into making Moses' basket. And we pulled this bulrush from right out here in the marsh. This is a very thick and very coarse straw. It can wreak havoc on the fingers when used a lot. But the plus with the bulrush is that it uh, gives more weight to your basket. Now once we got settled in on the plantation, if I happened to have fallen in love with another slave and we wanted to get hitched up, you used the term get married. Well, we didn't use that term. We used getting hitched up. But now they didn't recognize slave marriage. So if we wanted to cohabitate, live together, we had to get the master's permission. Why? Because we was his property. Bought, sold, done deal. And when we got permission to get <coughs> pitched up, it was with the understanding with the master that any time he was going to sell us off, that was just going to be it. Done deal. It didn't matter how long we were hitched up, five days, five years, ten days, ten years. At the end of that tenth day, if master got a good sale for my spouse, oh, he was gone. At the end of five or ten years, if master decided to sell all of our children, they were gone. Our names and the names of all slave families on the plantation would have been listed separately on the master's last will and testament as to who was going to get who upon his passing. Usually, we were distributed amongst his spouse and children first, then given out to other family members and friends. We couldn't sign contracts, couldn't testify for anybody in the court case of trial, and we did not get to leave the plantation, not until emancipation, with the exception of those few well-liked, close 
slave laborers who were close to the family. They were usually allowed to do a work for the master or to conduct business for the master outside the plantation. But when leaving, they would have to wear these special brass badges that alerted the outside to know that they had permission to be away from the plantation. So when it came time to doing wedding ceremonies and marriage vows, that was out for the slaves. So we did this thing we called jumping the broom. We made our own broom grass brooms and they looked like this. And yes, this still grows, the broom grass. We used our broom grass brooms to sweep the yard. You say yard, Gullah says yard. Why we call it sweeping the yard? Because we had a dirt floor in our cabins. So we called it sweeping the yard. They take a freshly made straw broom, decorate it, place it out in the open, and we jump the broom hand in hand, and that would be our contract if we got hitched up. Today in the Gullah culture, if any of our couples decide to do the jumping the broom ritual, they usually just take the regular wood handle broom, decorating this handle and the colors of the wedding or all white or they will leave the handle bare and place flowers and ribbon on the grass portion. The broom is then placed behind the couple as they stand at the altar. Once they say their vows, they will turn, face the congregation, jumping this broom facing the congregation or upon their exiting out of the church. Either way, the deal in the Gullah culture is this, whoever lands on the other side of the broom first is considered the boss. <laughs> yes, in Gullah, that's just how it goes. You consider the head of household. That's how that thing goes. Now, when those slave ships landed along our coastal waters from Florida all the way to Virginia, those of us coming off of those many slave ships, they had us tagged. Angola Negroes, Sierra Leone Negroes, Liberian Negroes, Nigerian Negroes, others. Well, that Angolian group ended up in the Carolinas in very, very large numbers. Why? I'm told that they were very good at working that rice field. So through the years, it went from Angola Negro to Gola Negroes. Angola, Gola. Today, our dialect says Gullah. Today, you will hear Gullah also paired with the term Geechee. Geechee, Gullah, Gullah, Geechee. Now, both of those terms are synonymous. But when you hear the Gullah term, the Gullah term makes reference to our ancestry and the fact that we in these parts are the ancestors of those West Africans who were brought to these parts of the Americas strictly to work rice. Not cotton, not cotton, rice. But we also ended up working any plantation that needed our labor for their cash crop, be it cattle, tobacco, corn, maize, brick, indigo, whatever was being grown, raised, and made on the plantation became our job. Now when you hear the Geechee term, the Geechee term makes reference to our location and our dialect. This Charleston dialect is a very, very fast-spoken rhythmic dialect. It's a dialect where you, where you will hear us changing blends of words, adding letters to words, taking letters away from words. We create sentences to say one thing, meaning something totally different. We will engage you in conversation, laugh with you, talk with you, talk about you all in one breath, and you have no idea what's going on. Gala. So now repeat after me. Come ya. Come ya. Binya. Binya. Come ya. Come ya. Binya. Binya. Those of you who are new to Charleston, first time as we Gullahs call you guys, come yas. Simply because you're coming here for the first time. I'm a binya because I've been here for a long time. Take your TH blends. When you're enunciating, you say properly this, that, there, them, then, those. In Gullah, when we're speaking, you hear us say this, that, there, them, then, those. You say river, you hear Gullah say river, over the river. You say vegetable, you hear Gullah say vegetable, a vegetable. You say vinegar, Gullah says vinegar. You say mouth with a TH sound, Gullah says mouth. I said, what you fellas plan on greasing your mouth on the day for supper? Greasing your mouth. What do you plan on eating? Taste the day for supper. If you were on the plantation years ago and you witnessed people coming in and out of the fields, you may have heard this conversation, may not have understood it. Mom, they have you walking in that field all day, they can't see, they can't see. Man, they have us working in the field all day today from can't see to can't see. Can't see to can't see, meaning we got up in the dark to go to work when we couldn't see. We didn't get to come home until dark when we still couldn't see. Walking from can't see to can't see. Now just to share with you how we can talk about you in company and you have no idea, what's your name? If I took Miss Heather home to meet my family, this is how the conversation would go. Now Heather would understand some things, but when we got to talking about Heather, she would understand no thing. So this is how the conversation would go. <laughs> Granny, met a nice woman. You say woman, God says woman. Granny, met a nice woman on the plantation name is Heather. Granny, please, see if we can find some of the kids with Heather to grease him out. But Granny, watch out for Heather. Now he's a nice gal. Granny, but tell me, see how I'm trying to pay chance. I just called her a thief. <laughs> I said, Ihan short of patience. Her hand is short of patience. In Goa, anyone whose hands are short of patience are quick to pick up things that don't belong to them. So what would happen to Miss Heather? Another thing, Granny would make sure Miss Heather had a belly full of Gullah food. 
But while Helen rolling around the house, everybody eyes and we always have a hand. <laughs> Making sure she wasn't picking up anything she wasn't supposed to. God bless you, Heather. Thank you so much. We ain't come study walk no more. Now, when Master heard them fellas singing, oh, he just knew he was going to get a whole lot of work out of them that day. And he usually did. But one thing many of the masters didn't know. Many a times when they would be singing songs, they would actually be singing out messages to the rest of the slave community. So if you woke up one morning and you heard them holding on to this one song all day long, morning, afternoon, evening time, they still humming and chanting that same song? Oh, you better believe that was a message. Wait in the water, wait in the water, chilling now, wait in the water. God's are gonna trouble, God's are gonna trouble, God's are gonna trouble the waters. Message, there was gonna be an escape that night. It was gonna happen by near or through water. All you may have heard, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Home where? To freedom. What was coming? That night, the Underground Railroad was going to be cruising through that plantation to pick up anybody who wanted to get off. And if you needed to get yourself ready, you needed to be hurry about it. Gullah, a people, a dialect, birthed out on the plantation. Coming from Africa, we brought with us our own form of worship. In Africa today, there's a term you hear used, it's called animism. It makes reference to those tribes that worship nature. They worship a creation, not a creator. Sun, moon, stars, trees, clouds, animals, basically that's what we brought with us. Once we got settled in on the master's plantation, we would steal away, sneak away, in the wee hours of the morning. Gullah called this full day clean in the morning. Full day clean meant those early hours of 2 a.m. before sunrise. They would go into the brush areas, do their circle dances, their ring shouts, and their call us, but master found out that, that was forbidden. Eventually, Many of the plantation owners began to build churches on their plantations, and eventually we were required to attend. Required? How so? Their clergy taught us about the master's God, who then becomes our God. Problem, they really didn't feel comfortable having us worship alongside them in their churches. So what they, they did is they built these one-room shanties we call praise houses. The very last cabin on your way back is a sample of a praise house. Those praise houses were where the slaves were allowed to worship. When we left the plantation at emancipation and we went into our own communities, we did not build churches. We built praise houses, replicas of what we had on the plantation that eventually grew into denominational churches. So now, exiting the plantation, we left illiterate. We left the plantation not knowing how to read and write. We left the plantation not knowing where we were born or when we were born, no record kept and no record given. My grandfather died in 1963, and my grandfather was 58 years old, and he died not ever knowing where he was born or when he was born. So he had chosen the 4th of July as his birthday because he said that's when everybody was having a good time. Smart man. <laughs> we left the plantation many a times not knowing where our mothers and fathers were. Sisters and brothers, grandmothers, grandfathers, no clue where anybody was. Why? Because there were so many times that we were sold away from each other, traded away from each other and many, many a times taken away from your mother at birth and given or sold away. Now they were getting to meet that birth mother, birth father, or birth family. That was the plight of many of our ancestors at emancipation. So when we began to learn how to read and write, the Bible becomes the center part of a Gullah Geechee household. So in closing today, I'd like to share with you the Our Father prayer as written in Gullah. We fought him. But they in heaven, let everybody honor your name. We pray soon you will rule over the whole world. Whatsoever thing you want in this world, let them be so. Same like in heaven. Give you the food we need this day, yeah, and every day. And please, Lord, forgive me for the bad thing we do to other people. Same as you forgive them other people for the bad thing they do to me. Amen. Gala, West Africa, a people, a dialect, birthed out on the plantation. Slavery. That's all right, slavery. That's all right, slavery. That's all right, that's all right. Belongs my soul, 
got a seat up in the kingdom. That's all right. Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Michael, and they call me the Geechee Gal. Gala storyteller, historian, Boone Hall Plantation. God bless every last one of you. Welcome to Charleston. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. We did it. We saw Boone Hall Plantation. Yay. Do you feel educated? I do. I feel many things. You feel me? It's, it's both beautiful and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> there is some t terrifying elements, but everyone got to. And actually, I'm the only person that's been here. Mm -hmm. I've actually, I think I've been here two, two or three times, but it's been like 10, 15 years. So it was really cool, like relearning everything. It was a fun experience. Now we got to go home. We have to go home. So we got back safely, which was good, and then we decided to come to Clark's, and uh, one of the things they have for an appetizer here is alligator, which is kind of weird, actually, because just the other day we saw a bunch of them, and we are like, oh, how cute, now we're eating them, but anyway. Um, so, everyone, this is, your, <laughs> this, is a, this is your first time trying alligator, and it was good? Delicious. Dan's had, we actually tried it first time ever with Dan. Lindsay, what do you think? It's more of a mental thing that I'm not going to have anymore. Oh, okay. It's good, but I just... I understand. Yeah, I can... I, I get that. I can eat venison all day long, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm going to something else. Steph, Steve, what'd you think? No, wait, Steph, you said you had alligator before? Yeah, in Tennessee I've had fried gator. Oh, okay. I did see a lot of adorable gators, but I had no... I was not responsible for this gator. <laughs> Um, it was shockingly delicious. Like, yeah. I, I, I often do things just taste like chicken. I just think, it doesn't taste like chicken. Mm -hmm. It tastes like chicken. Yeah. It was like the chicken with like some different spices to it. Just, mm -hmm. But it was like that and it was really, really good. Yeah. It's it's good. It's really good stuff. Australian animals, one. Water, three. Water. Oh, okay. Key. No, no, no. No, it's... like the keys. Oh. <laughs> well, let's well, start with... Oh, stream, definitely. Let's start stream with the water. obvious ones. Definitely, probably... Don't touch it. <laughs> so probably stream. stream. Probably stream. Water. And probably platypus. Yeah, platypus Don't is good. Don't you think platypus? Because they, they like... They drink water. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling platypus. People suit? People Bathing drink suit? water. And... No, no. Platypus before suit. I think platypus... Like yeah, People in Europe drink water. <gasps> All right, so what's the other water one? Um, Key. Tap. Tap water. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like that one. Tap. <gasps> oh, wow. Wow. Guys are allowed one more guess. All right, so uh, let's be back tomorrow, don't we? Good job. Bye-bye. Do 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 do